Why wasn't cast iron produced in the Middle Ages? How did coke save the Industrial Revolution? Did quartz puddling produce puddles or iron? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I'm Professor Jerome Markenberg, and I've been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you about why cast iron could not be produced in the Middle Ages until the 15th century, how Darby's Coke process fueled the Industrial Revolution, and how quartz puddling and Bessemer's converter allowed mass quantities of steel to be produced. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video, so make sure to stick around for that. But first, make sure to click like, share, especially subscribe, and that little bell thingy, so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. In medieval Europe, metalworking was next to textiles in importance and more varied. Everything from gold to blacksmithing, forging, heating, and hammering wrought iron into everything from tools, arms, and armor to plowshares and simple domestic items. But ironworking was slow and difficult requiring a variety of smelting and refining techniques, which kept production costly and low. In the late Middle Ages, on average, little more than a pound of iron was produced per capita per year, mostly as arms and armor, so that little was left for other needs. After iron ore had been mined, it was first smelted, the ore separated from the metal in a bloomery, the bloomery is seen here. A furnace with a bellows used to force air through burning charcoal and iron ore, with the metal collecting in the bottom of the furnace as a spongy bloom. The bloom would be reheated to soften the iron and melt the slag, the stuff you can't use, and then repeatedly beaten and folded over and over and over again to force out the molten slag. Laboriously, this process produced wrought iron. The bar iron produced can then be turned into steel by carburizing low carbon iron repeatedly pounding, folding, and welding it over and over again into sheets of steel for weapons or armor. Cast iron was not produced in medieval Europe because of the difficulty of producing very high temperatures, which is needed, until the blast furnace came into usage in the 15th century, as the picture is shown here where a bellows, often driven by a water wheel, blasted air into a furnace, causing the iron to superheat, blowing out of the ore some, but certainly not all, of the impurities. The impurities would be the ones that would allow the iron to crack. This then allowed molten iron to be drawn off from the bottom of the furnace and cast directly into either pots, brackets, or even bars of pig iron, which can then be hammered into wrought iron. If 
By the end of the 15th century, rolling, cutting, stamping, and wire drawing mills had appeared, lowering costs further and making metal goods more common. But this led to deforestation and lack of timber for home heating and cooking, along with construction and shipbuilding. This problem was solved in 1709 by Abraham Darby, a Quaker ironmaster at Colebrookdale in Shropshire, who devised a method to strip out the impurities in coal and turn it into coke, an almost pure form of carbon, allowing the coke to be used as fuel and blast furnaces without making the pig iron unusable. So here's the coke. And of course, the idea is found with the bellows driven by a water wheel. We'll superheat it with the slag coming in. Remember, if you use the charcoal, some of the impurities, some of the things in the charcoal will make their way into the iron. With coke, being an almost pure form of carbon, that doesn't really happen. How does the devil behave? Combined with Henry Court's puddling process, you see here, puddling the ore, essentially it's just stirring it around. And the rolling process of 1783, which puddles, essentially just stirring it, like you're stirring a pot and you're cooking, the molten iron with long rods, which would serve to burn off more of the carbon, and then ran it through grooved rollers that squeezed out more impurities, iron production by 1800 exceeded 200,000 tons. In the 19th century came further innovations, such as the Bessemer converter, produced by, you see here, Henry Bessemer, that produced steel cheaper than ever before without using more fuel by blowing air right through molten iron, burning off virtually all the excess carbon, which is what you see taking place here. Good woman says, hey, I must bid you. Siemens in Germany improved this further in the 1860s with a process that produced a steel of such high quality that it was at once used in making rails bridges, ships, skyscrapers, tools, toys, and many other products. And world steel production jumped from 500,000 tons in 1865 to 50 million tons by 1914. Oh, get at the pits were at work once again, Derry Down. The wrap-up quote. Rotherham is famous for its ironworks, of which it contains one very large one and one or two smaller. Near the town are two collieries, out of which the iron ore is dug, as well as the coal to work it with. These collieries and works employ together near 500 hands. The ore is here worked into metal and then into bar iron, and the bar is sent to Sheffield to be worked into all parts of the country. This is one branch of their business. Another is the foundry, in which they run the ore into metal, pigs, and then cast it into all sorts of boilers, pans, plowshares, etc. Arthur Young, 1771. Let me know what you think of this quote in the comment section below. Also, what you liked about this video and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like, share, especially subscribe, as it will help me bring you more great videos just like this one. And click on that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.